Welcome to Access Entertainment, the latest in movies, television, music, and more. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Access Entertainment. I'm Heather Catlin on location at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii, talking with the cast of Midway out November 8th. The Battle of Midway took place just six months after the U.S. was bombed at Pearl Harbor. It was a pivotal turning point in one of the most important American victories in World War II. Now the true story of this heroic feat is heading to the big screen. If we lose, the Japanese on the West Coast, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, will burn. Director Roland Emmerich's retelling of the 1942 Battle of Midway is both action-packed and entertaining, but it's also a history lesson. Well, it was that the first time I um, uh, felt responsibility, what I did. You know, when you make like a movie like Independence Day or like uh, 2012, Day After Tomorrow. A Day After Tomorrow, I felt also a little bit uh, responsible to kind of tell the audience something. But uh, when you like kind of tell a piece of history, uh, then you like feel an additional, you know, like kind of uh, pressure on you that you do a good job. If you know that you came through, when people are counting on you. Be able to face anything. Some of the actors that signed on to this major production, like Dennis Quaid and Patrick Wilson, told us this was more than just another gig. It was an opportunity to honor their own family. My dad was in a merchant marine in the Atlantic. You know, they fought U-boats, I guess. They were there were city ducks for U-boats. Yeah. They were trying to bring supplies. They were huge in the Atlantic though. Merchant Marines. Yeah, my grandfather was on the Mighty Mo before it actually went to battle when it was just birthed uh, in, uh, out of Virginia. So he was stationed on the, on the Missouri. My great uncle was uh, stationed in Guam, was, uh, was Merchant Marine, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I've, I've had a few. I, I just feel so blessed. I feel so happy to be a part of it, you know. My family's Navy, so to give them the opportunity to see something like this come to light and the fact that I'm a part of it. You know, that's uh, it's just an honor, you know, to be able to represent that for everybody, so. Yeah, I think about my granddads, you know, and, um, and my grandma, who, who, who was in the, the, the land army. Um, but my grandfathers, one of them was in the, the Air Force and the other one was, um, was in the army, the British army, and um, their bravery, it, 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 it paved the way for me to be able to have such a wonderful life. And I've, I've led such a a blessed life and I'm so grateful for that and so you know it, it really is quite a heavy kind of emotion that I've never felt on any other project I've ever worked on um, you know I hope I can have these this kind of profound learning experience again sometime but you know maybe I won't maybe I'll never have another project that, that kind of feels this kind of emotionally heavy I mean I don't want to act like it was all serious you know we had a great time on set yeah. But um, it, was a, it was a serious proposition and one that us two in particular took very seriously. We need to throw a punch so they know what it feels like to be hit. The whole time I was watching this movie, I kept on thinking, God, the gut and the grit and the courage these men had to have was just unfathomable. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I thought I've, that reading it too. Yep, I felt like a complete and utter wuss. Um, there's a couple things that were on their side at the time. I mean, uh, they weren't raised with World War II history. Right. They didn't grow up in a television era, which would happen later in the 20th century, where we're fully aware of the destruction and harsh realities of the violence of war. Yeah. It was more of um, this sort of almost romantic, poetic idea of servicing your country, which is not, not to take away from it by any means, but the time lended itself to a certain amount of audacity yeah. that um, we just can't have anymore because of the way, you know, things are right in front of our face right. and, and we know how terrifying these things are. And uh, that level of, of courage really is mind-blowing, just, just having to run face, you know, face forward into you know, certain death is yeah. just, it blows my mind. And uh, you're absolutely right. These, the men and women, whether at home or overseas, were just um, a level of heroism that I don't think we have really seen since. Can you wrap your head around what they had to do during Midway? I mean, it is difficult, you know, 
to, 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 you know, I was born in 1983, you know, I've grown up in, in, in um, relative peace, you know, and um, so, you know, it is, a, it is a, we do have to use our imagination, you know, the amazing thing about the heroics of the war is, you know, this was, these, this bravery was happening everywhere, you know, yes, this, this is a story that should be told and we told it because it has such a incredible, incredible plot twist and ended so successfully. But you know, in Iwo Jima and everywhere in the European um, war, there was so much incredible bravery on all sides, you know, and, and, and so we had a responsibility to these individual men, but also we really just wanted to kind of represent the bravery of all of the men involved in the war, including the Japanese, including the Russian, German, Italian, English, you know, the Dutch, it's, it's really, um, it was important to us. Can you even imagine being in their place? I'm sure that in life, the for the men that fought in this battle, I don't think they could grasp it either before going in. Yeah, you know, the courage is really being, ha you know, having fear and the doing something anyway. Yeah, that's thank God for them. Director Roland Emmerich has made some amazing movies about America. Think The Patriot, Independence Day, White House Down. But he told me he's been working on this film and wanting to do it for about 20 years now. I read that you have wanted to make this film for basically 20 years now. What was it about the story that made you hang on tight to this? I think it's the, it was the bravery in a way. Um, a little bit my family history. Uh, my uncle uh, died in World War II in similar fashion than actually uh, Dick Best got affected with it. His lungs got shot. And so there was a, a part personal, part fascination. Uh, with the intricacy of this battle. And, uh, and I always knew it can be not only the battle, it has to be the six months yeah. leading up to the battle because without um, um, uh, Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor, you don't understand what, what happened in, uh, in uh, Midway. How important was it for you to stay extremely factual? And where was that line drawn of where you could have a little fun with the characters, maybe personal life? Or was it all factual? Mm, it, it's what happens uh, in the scenes, um, uh, in the action scenes, it's totally accurate. What they did in their bedrooms, uh, what they talked, uh, who knows, right? But um, it was so, it was, was constantly going back and forth between them. What like kind of Nimitz uh, talked with uh, uh, Edwin Layton, nobody knows, you know what I mean? Uh, but, um, but it's as factual as you can make a movie, you know, because uh, it also has to be entertaining. The German director told us he's fascinated with American history. It was particularly important for him to tell the story of Midway from several different perspectives, so the audience understands it wasn't all about just the battle. It was also about the incredible work of the intelligence officers who broke a crucial code. The Japanese are playing something bigger. So what's the target? We believe it's Midway. Washington disagrees. Washington is wrong. Patrick Wilson plays Admiral Edwin Layton, one of the most key leaders in the intelligence unit who figured out that Japan was planning on ambushing Midway. It was because of his leadership, along with a few other key officers, that helped change the course of World War II. Watching the movie and uh, touring Pearl Harbor, just learning about the intelligence behind the attack was yeah. stunning. Uh, did you know any of that going into the movie? No. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't. It was something that, you know, it's it's not all the. I think that's uh, that is what's interesting about 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 this version of Midway that really digs into that side that really can show both sides of it because it's not the it's not the flashy side. It's not the, it's not the, uh, you know. I mean, you're 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 back there trying to mentally manage this war, which is completely unmanageable, and you're yeah. doing your best. It's a big wide world out there. It's a big ocean. It's just huge, and these guys but, are out there pulling the trigger. Yeah, I, do, I I knew quite a bit about it because I'm history wonk to begin with. And, you know, imagine today, there's no way they could sneak across the uh, Pacific Ocean like that with the satellites that we had, and they parked out at about 200 miles yeah. out there. And if you go over, if you go to Turtle Bay Resort. On the north side of the island, that same radar station yeah. is right there on top of the cliff. You can see it. Where yeah. They just flew over and flew right down the central mountains of this and came in out of the sun. When accepting this role, what kind of responsibility did you take to make sure that you would portray these American heroes accurately? Uh, yeah, it's, it's incredibly imp important um, just because they 
reading it, it almost it almost seemed fake. Like some of these scenes with Bruno Guido, Nick Jonas's character, Darren Criss's character. There's just so many like th there was so many moments that almost seemed on like seemed like it was written for a movie. So to know that people actually experienced these moments in time, um, yeah, it was an extreme responsibility that was put on really everyone t um, to make it as authentic and, and real as possible. I mean, a tremendous responsibility. When you're in that moment, you don't, you don't think about the weight of it. And just like when you're playing your, your character, you don't think about his place in history, at least I don't. I concentrate on what he wanted to do, and that because that's, that's the way he operated. And so you've got a lot of history that you can read and watch documentaries and glean all this information and what people said about him and inform your own character. And luckily, we were supported by a script and a director that have the same passion and um, attention to detail. Um, so you feel like you're telling a, a, a truthful story. Because at the end of the day, that's all, that's all we want to do is, is, is honor the legacy, but, but, yeah. but, but show the courage. Coming up, making a movie like Midway isn't exactly easy. They have people who have to watch out for sharks. Okay, There's that's sharks crazy. Here. The hardest parts and funniest moments when filming. Plus, he's the producer, director, and writer. Edward Norton talks about his latest passion project in theater soon. Honestly, reminded me of characters I've loved, like Forrest Gump or, or uh, Dustin Hoffman's character in Rain Man. Welcome back to Access Entertainment. I'm Heather Catlin on location at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii, talking with the cast of Midway Out November 8th. It's a movie based on real life events. Director Roland Emmerich's epic retelling of the 1942 Battle of Midway is already getting rave reviews. He uses cutting edge technology to put the audience in the battle. He does use a lot of computer generated sequences, but told us the sets he had to build to make this movie happen were unlike any other. What was the hardest part about filming this? I mean, you had to recreate so much. The hardest part, to be honest, was like to create a flight deck indoors. It was just I'm pretty. Hard. It was just like a, it was just like an ongoing uh, discussion we had, like until the the day before we shot it uh, uh, or just shot the scenes. It was just like, but then we found you know like a way to do it, and uh, I think it looks pretty good. And you said you shot right out here for the underwater yes, scene. Yes, right there, three three miles out. Just, just a boatload of equipment out there. Yeah, exactly. With like uh, with divers and stuff, they have to have security divers, and they have people who have to watch out for sharks. Okay, There's that's sharks crazy. Here. <laughs> sharks okay, here. you need to act, and you need to watch out for <laughs> sharks. Good luck with that. Get it, baby! Yeah! Hey, this yeah. is my first uh, go at. Uh, a film of this size and, and, and scale, it's certainly on a, a production value side. Um, Kean's had a bit of experience with a lot of sort of big action sequences and movies with a lot of green screen and special effects. I This is definitely my first dance with that and to have my first dance be with somebody who is kind of the, the dance captain of, of uh, special effects, uh, Mr. Roland Emmerich, was, was just such a thrill. I mean, um, you know, we were saying earlier how the being on the gimbal and uh, on these planes was probably about as close as we could get to being in an actual torpedo bomber without actually being up in the air doing it. Yeah, um, yeah it was it cool as, as a severe understatement. <laughs> yeah, I think every every branch, whether it was the the, the, the costume department oh, yeah. or just in terms of making little pieces, I, I remember my first day on set, I went into costume, uh, went to see the costume department, and they had, you know, I was they were fitting me with a parachute, like a real, you know, World War II parachute, and they had all these extra, you know, life vests that were from that time, like, so just, th just these small things that audience members will probably never even notice, things that I'm wearing that they can't see, and I think right. that having that as an actor uh, helps you, you know, it, it helps it feel more authentic for you, therefore it hopefully helps the audience as well. Both Patrick Stevens and Dennis Quaid told us throughout filming they felt the gravity of this film. When you show both sides of a film, you uh, of, of a story of conflict, you understand that these were uh, these were ordinary men put in an extraordinary situation. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a catchy line, I guess, but it's uh, 
I, I think you understand the humanity involved on both sides uh, and, and the weight that each shot and each death, each mm -hmm. success and each failure has. Yeah, you tell a story where a lot of, a lot of people died over, uh, you know, service for their countries. And that's battle midway. Yeah. It could have gone the other way. Mm -hmm. It really could if there's, there was a 30 minute gap there where <laughs> they had, had to have their planes come back to the ship and, and refuel. refuel. And if we hadn't caught him, it would have gone the other way. And the outcome of the war could have been very different. Yeah. yeah. America was very vulnerable. If you're looking for more of a That's drama, right. you'll want to catch Motherless bombed. Brooklyn. Written, directed, something. and produced by Edward Norton, we who also plays the, the lead character. I got something wrong with me. That's the first thing to know. I got threads in my heads. I got threads in my heads, man. I twitch and shout a lot. If. Makes me look like a damn freak show. Can't you ever I'm cut that out? I'm sorry. Touch it, Bailey. I'm sorry. The R-rated film follows a private detective who has Tourette's about. syndrome. He tries to this. solve the murder of his mentor and only friend. Frank Minna, Private Eye. Boys. Frank, frankly, frankly, Franco. Norton came to Atlanta to talk about this film that he describes as a passion project. He read the book Motherless Brooklyn almost 20 years ago and instantly knew he wanted to bring it to the big screen. But it obviously took a lot of time. I had mutual friends with the writer, Jonathan Lethem, in New York in the mid-90s, and someone, someone tipped me off that he had written this book about a detective with Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. And, um, and that, that kind of tweaked my interest as an actor, you know, and, uh, and I, somehow, I, got the book, I got the book before it was published and I read it and the character, the character was so memorable and so, um, so complex just because he's, he's funny and Jeez. poignant and, and talented but afflicted yeah, and really. just, just all this bundle of paradoxes and... Um, also very self-aware. Yeah, yeah, and, and, um, and honestly, my, my initial impulse was not like a, a, to make a film soup to nuts. It, it was really just, a, I was a greedy actor l <laughs> looking at a character that was like a seven course meal. A and also that honestly reminded me of characters I've loved like Forrest Gump or, or uh, Dustin Hoffman's character in Rain Man or, or A Beautiful Mind. You know, he's, he's one of those, he's an underdog hero who from, you, you just root for him from the get-go. You're inside his head. You know he's a good person. You know he's talented, but but other people underestimate him and treat him badly. And you're you're on his you're on his side, and you're just rooting for him. And and then in a way he takes you into this adventure. But um, but this idea of a person who is getting in his own way because of this very very strange and unusual condition that he has was really uh, compelling to me. You got a head just like mine, always turning things around. Some people call it a gift, but it's a brain affliction just the same. You remember what I said? She doesn't know. She doesn't know. What don't I know? You know, directors, they see everything from a 30,000 foot view. How do you direct while being an actor and being in the moment? Uh, a lot, a lot of it for me is accepting, accepting that you're, you're not going to be able to work as an actor this, the way you might, if you're, if you're, if you have someone brilliant directing you. You know what I mean? You, you don't have the same kind of um, luxury of, of concentration. You just don't. Um, and so you have to. So preparation is just super important. More rehearsal, more. Uh, as an actor, I had to do a lot more of my work. Uh, earlier, you know. Um, we had 20 years, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, you know, that's not even, that's not even actually totally facetious. I, I, I was living with this for a long time. I was thinking about him for a long time, and I, was, I wrote the dialogue because we, the author, we, 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 it's a fairly big departure. The book was a modern novel, but we, we decided to set it in the 50s because in the book, it's hard to explain, but they feel like 50s characters living in the modern world and we just decided like we liked the idea of setting it in the 50s because also things there were things taking place getting back to your sort of corruption and power and there were things taking place in New York in the 50s that were very very um, very significant and very they that still have ramifications today and that honestly I thought were kind of resonant 
with a lot of what's going on yeah. in America today. A lot of a lot of the debates <laughs> we're having, yes. a lot of things yes. I think some of us are a little <laughs> afraid of that are going on. Um, there was a lot of there there was a lot that I thought was worth um, um, digging into. In the in the same way that um, honestly, like great films like Chinatown that I loved that that look at the the hidden crime that's yeah. underneath oh. the reality of L.A. Uh, this, there, there, there are secrets about the way modern New York was built that I don't think a lot of people know, and I thought it would be fun to use this underdog hero as a way of going into that world. Diving um, into that. Yeah, and I loved, I, I, I think that, I love films like L.A. Confidential, and you know, I, I don't think we, we, we it's hard, we, we see fewer of those films, and I think, I think people love them, and I, I, I was determined to kind of try to make one of those almost old fashioned kind of films. Still to come, a parody of Nazi Germany may sound a bit horrifying, but many are saying it's hilarious and a possible Oscar contender. Welcome back to Access Entertainment. I'm Heather Catlin on location at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii, talking with the cast of Midway out November 8th. But if you're looking to go to the theater now, you have a lot to choose from. Writer and director Taika Waititi brings his signature style of humor to his newest film, Jojo Rabbit. But a comedy drama about World War II Nazi Germany? Not exactly the easiest movie to sell. It's a very difficult movie to describe to people because as soon as you say, oh, it's set in World War II, a lot of people go, Mm, okay. The movie follows a little boy named Jojo who prides himself on being a Nazi. His imaginary friend, an idiotic Adolf Hitler. Yeah, it definitely d could have gone very wrong, but you know, it, it was. It, yeah, you yeah. knew when you read it, it was, it was, it was going to strike that perfect tone. So Jojo soon realizes his mother, played by Scarlett Johansson, is hiding a Jewish girl. From there, his worldview is turned upside down. Were you hesitant on doing this? I wasn't hesitant. Um, for about 17 seconds, I was hesitant about playing <laughs> Hitler, and I got over that pretty quick. Uh, but the, I w no, I wasn't, because I felt like it was an important story, and I knew the message, I knew what I was trying to say. Yeah. And I feel like if you go into making a film with that in mind, you know, it's, it's better than finishing the film and then deciding what it's about. As soon as I read the script, it <clears throat> slotted into a long tradition of movies that use satire and humor to mock Hitler, ironically. How were you guys pitched this movie? Comedy, drama, Nazi, Hitler? Um, well, I think it's funny, as an Englishman who is quite tall with sort of blondish hair, inevitably you're gonna get a phone call to play a Nazi at some point. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it just seemed inevitable. I thought, well, here's the one. And last question, you're getting a lot of Oscar buzz. What does that mean to you? Uh, I don't know, buzz. It's a buzz. Buzz, Oscar buzz. What is Oscar buzz? I'm really thankful, and, and I'm, I, I think I think it'll be, it'll be great. Yeah, I just hope that they give um, me a best supporting. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, at, least a, at least a norm. We'll make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> Another movie now out in theaters, Black and Blue. What the hell is going on? These streets are war zone. You're blue now. Naomi Harris returns to the big screen as a rookie cop who captures the murder of a young drug dealer on her body cam. After realizing the murder was committed by corrupt cops who have big ties to the community, she finds herself on the run, determined to survive and expose those corrupt cops. It's all right. We got you. Wes, hey, don't be stupid, Wes. All he wants is the body cam. Being able to make a film that actually dealt with what's going on today in society was a really, really big moment for me. Yeah. Um, just as an African-American filmmaker, we don't normally get to have movies that could embody messaging, but at the same time allow people to have a good time in the movie theater. Every cop and criminal in this city is coming to find her. What did the movie mean to you? Well, I did this movie for Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin. There's a lot of police officers right now to this day who are sitting on the truth and real information about what happened in these situations. And they're a part of the blue code where they will not speak out. And that's how a Naomi Harris character is created. Because she was not willing to go to sleep in good conscience and say, I know some information about what really happened 
and I'm not willing to speak out. I want them to be inspired to have discussions, um, discussions about all kinds of things, like the use of body ca cameras, about the breakdown in relationships between the African-American community and the police force. And also, ultimately, the most important thing is Alicia's message at the, the end of the movie. It's about be the change, you know, mm -hmm. standing up for what you believe in, standing up against what is wrong and doing the right thing. Next, the major milestone, the Joker, just passed. The Joker is still one of the top movies at the box office and it just passed a major milestone. The comic villain's origin story is now the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. Thank you so much for watching this special edition of Access Entertainment. From Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii, I'm Heather Catlin.